Picture a tiger. Tigers are known for their beautiful stripes, which they always keep the same. However, imagine if the tiger's stripes could change their size, position, and colors from time to time. Magical, right? But that's exactly what happens with one titan of our solar system, Jupiter. Why and how? Well, astronomers might just have the answer, so let's see. Jupiter is a huge and fascinating planet. When you're looking at its picture from far away, it's like seeing a beautiful sunrise. Here we have an entire palette, from creamy pale yellows to caramel browns, with even some blue shades. Jupiter is a fascinating place made mostly of hydrogen and helium, just like our sun. However, it didn't gather enough stuff during its formation to become a star. Instead, it became a colossal ball of gas that could fit more than 1,300 Earths inside. Jupiter has these interesting patterns of dark and light clouds that go around the planet in alternating bands like giant stripes. These dark stripes are called belts, and lighter ones are called zones. Actually, it's not unique in this. Earth and Jupiter both have these cool patterns in their atmospheres. It's just that Earth has a few of them, but Jupiter has a lot more. Why are these belts brown and beige? Those can be explained by the combination of hydrogen, helium, and other trace elements in the planet's atmosphere. It's like mixing different colors of paint to create new shades. These belts create beautiful patterns across the planet's surface. Now, because Jupiter has such a massive atmosphere and a weather system similar to Earth's, it experiences some extraordinary storms. So even though these stripes may look calm and peaceful, they're actually part of a wild weather system. It's like a never-ending storm party happening there. These belts and zones move in opposite directions around the planet. The belts go against Jupiter's rotation, like going against the flow, while the zones go with it, joining the dance. And not only do they move in different directions, but they also exist at different heights in the planet's atmosphere. The belts are like regions where things are rising up, like bubbles in a fizzy drink. So the cloud tops in the belts are higher up in the sky compared to the cloud tops in the zones, which are more like sinking areas. So even though Earth and Jupiter have this similarity, their weather is completely different. It's like comparing apples and oranges. One of the most famous storms on Jupiter is the Great Red Spot. But why is it red? Well, that's a bit of a mystery. Scientists think that the storm sits at a higher altitude than the rest of the atmosphere. This means it gets a stronger dose of sunlight. Imagine standing on a hilltop where the sun shines brighter on you compared to the surroundings. In a similar way, the Great Red Spot gets more radiation from the sun. The storm also contains some special chemicals in its clouds, like ammonia and acetylene. When these chemicals receive that extra radiation, they react in a unique way, giving the storm its distinct red color. It's like a special effect in a cosmic theater. Anyway, the stripes look pretty cool and all. But what's the big mystery around them? Well, you see, one day scientists decided to look at data from deep inside Jupiter, about 30 miles below the surface. And after peeking in Jupiter's secrets, they noticed something strange. When they looked at Jupiter using a special type of light called infrared, the colors of its stripes actually switched around. The light bands that were pale and creamy in normal pictures become dark in the infrared view. The dark bands that were belts before now shined brightly in the infrared. This suggests something interesting. The belts on Jupiter have thinner cloud coverings compared to the zones. It's like the belts are wearing sheer, see-through outfits while the zones have thicker clouds like fluffy jackets. So, what we see as dark bands in normal pictures turn out to be bright in the infrared, hinting that these belts have less cloud stuff blocking the light. But here's the most strange part. Every few years, something changes. It's like the weather on Jupiter goes through a wild roller coaster ride. The colors of the belts can change, and sometimes the whole weather pattern becomes a bit crazy for a while. Scientists have been scratching their heads, trying to figure out why this happens. So they've decided to use a special spacecraft called Juno to investigate this. Since 2016, Juno has been gathering a lot of information about Jupiter, like a spy collecting clues. One of the things Juno has been looking at is Jupiter's magnetic field. Just like Earth, 
Jupiter has a magnetic field. It's like an invisible bubble that surrounds the planet, extending to space. This magnetic field is really important because it protects the planet and everything on it. It acts like a shield against harmful particles from space, like those coming from the sun. But Jupiter's way bigger than us, so his protective shield is much stronger. Magnetic fields are generated by something called a dynamo, which is like a big swirling conducting fluid inside the planet. This fluid moves around and rotates, kind of like a dance party happening deep within the planet. So, scientists have been looking at the data collected by Juno over the years and noticed something interesting. Jupiter's magnetic field has its own little motions, kind of like when you see waves in the ocean. Scientists call these motions torsional oscillations, which is just a fancy way of saying wave-like movements. It's like Jupiter is doing its own magnetic dance. Now let's imagine that Jupiter's insides are like a giant pot of boiling soup. Deep within Jupiter, there are slow currents that carry heat upwards, just like a conveyor belt. This heat eventually reaches the upper part where we see the clouds. But here's where things get interesting. Imagine someone starts stirring the soup really fast with a spoon. Those wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, act just like that spoon. They create a disturbance that messes up the slow currents. Now this disruption has a big impact on Jupiter's weather. It's like turning up the heat in the kitchen and changing the way the soup cooks. The patterns of rising and sinking in the clouds, which we call upwelling and downwelling, get all mixed up. A whirlwind in the soup. Our clever scientists also noticed something special near Jupiter's equator. They discovered a concentrated spot of magnetism called the Great Blue Spot. And guess what? This spot is slowing down, like it's taking a break from its usual fast movement. This suggests that a new type of wavy motion, a new dance, is about to begin. So to sum it all up, the scientists have come up with a cool idea. These wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, disrupt the slow currents inside Jupiter, messing up the cloud patterns and causing wild weather. And when the scientists calculated the time it takes for these wave-like motions to happen, they discovered that they match the same time periods when the stripes on Jupiter change. So, in simple terms, the scientists think that these wave-like movements in Jupiter's magnetic field are causing the changes in the stripes on the planet. Pieces of a puzzle are coming together. Scientists are still trying to fully understand why this happens, but it's an exciting step forward in unraveling the mysteries of our vast universe. But there are still some mysteries left to solve. To find more answers, scientists need to keep watching Jupiter closely in the future. By observing how the clouds change, they can check if their theory is correct or if it needs some adjustments. From its massive storms to its colorful belts, Jupiter never fails to amaze us with its cosmic wonders. It may not have ignited as a star, but it shines brightly as a gas giant, captivating us with its size and beauty. So keep your curiosity alive and always reach for the stars. Extremely hot and insanely fast. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Oh wait, you mean the space thing. Okay, first, they discovered Peg 51, an exoplanet that orbits a star similar to ours. An exoplanet is any planet outside of our solar system that orbits a star that's not the Sun. This planet was completely different from anything we've ever found. Almost the same diameter as Jupiter, but half the gas giant's mass. It took only four days for this exoplanet to orbit its star, which seemed impossible. It was definitely too fast for something so massive. And then, scientists started finding something they've named hot Jupiters all over space. Lots of heated gas giants were located only a couple of million miles away from their stars. Sometimes, there were a couple of space bodies orbiting their stars pretty closely, and many were a few times bigger than Earth. Solar systems where they found hot Jupiters are not like ours. We have a neat system with smaller rocky planets on the inside and big gas giants on the outside. And almost all of them peacefully orbit the Sun, following their trajectories. Everything is in order. When a star is at the earliest stage of its formation, it creates a disk of gases, debris, and dust surrounding it. It's called an accretion disk. These gases slowly get pulled into the star because of its gravitational forces. And this leads to some kind of a stellar whirlpool. 
The outer parts of the disk are more gas-dense than the center. With time, the whirlpool effect gets even stronger. The same thing happens with hot Jupiters, which causes these gas giants to start orbiting much faster than usual. This also carries it further toward the star in a tightening spiral. Luckily, our Jupiter didn't become a hot Jupiter. Our gas giant started its life as an icy Earth-sized asteroid, which is different from the way hot Jupiters form. During the time when it was forming, Jupiter was around four times as far from the Sun as it is today, somewhere between Uranus and Neptune. About 2 to 3 million years after Jupiter first formed in the accretion disk of our Sun, it started a 700 million year long phase astronomers call the Grand Tack. Now, tack is something a boat performs when going towards a buoy and then slipping past and around it. Then it speeds up and goes in the direction where it came from. That was the same thing Jupiter started doing. And in its tightening orbital migrations, the planet's gravity could have moved many asteroids and other space bodies, distorted the orbits of larger planets, and caused collisions and chaos. Jupiter's grand tack would have destroyed many big space bodies. It's a could-have-been scenario, but luckily, Jupiter changed its course and became a peaceful gas giant. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn were starting their own version of this chaotic process. Saturn even got so big that its gravity started pulling Jupiter away from its orbit. But after some time, these gas giants' orbits became locked. Then both of them managed to clear away the gases remaining between them. And since these gases were some sort of fuel for the planet's migrations, Jupiter and Saturn could both finally settle into the stable orbits we know today. Jupiter can still lob one to two icy asteroids at the inner planets from time to time. But when our planet was younger, this could have been one of the processes that formed the oceans on Earth. But Jupiter is much calmer these days. Saturn's gravitational forces have moderated the situation and are now keeping it under control. Now, Jupiter is our protector. It's two and a half times the mass of the other planets of our solar system combined. It's some sort of a gravitational shield orbiting around the inner part of the solar system. Jupiter redirects incoming debris and asteroids away from the inner planets – Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars – keeping us all safe. Because of this, Earth has always been protected, so our planet has had enough time to evolve complex life forms. And it hasn't been destroyed by asteroids, hot Jupiters, or other space bodies. Jupiter wasn't the only planet that could have collided with Earth. Scientists think Mercury might have been involved in a hit-and-run accident with our planet. Mercury is the innermost planet in our solar system. It's the closest to the Sun and the smallest planet out there. And it also keeps getting smaller. Nowadays, its diameter is around 9 miles smaller compared to its size 4 billion years ago. Scientists think this might be happening because the planet's core is made of iron, and this iron is cooling and becoming solid, which is slowly reducing the planet's size. Mercury is the planet with the biggest number of craters in our solar system. Its atmosphere is really thin, so it can do nothing to keep the planet protected from meteors. The largest crater on Mercury's surface is at least 963 miles across. It could fit Western Europe, from Germany to Portugal. The object that formed such a crater must have been at least 62 miles long. With all these craters, Mercury looks similar to our Moon. It orbits the Sun faster than the other planets, so one year on Mercury lasts around 88 Earth days. That means celebrating a birthday every three months or even more often. At the same time, the planet rotates so slowly that a day on Mercury lasts almost 59 Earth days – a long time to wait to go to bed. There's a piece of Mercury on our planet. In 2012, a green meteorite was found at a street market in Morocco. Scientists studied its composition and concluded it could be from Mercury. Mercury doesn't have its own moons because of its small size and weak gravity. Plus, the planet is too close to the Sun. By the way, the only other planet without moons in our solar system is Venus. Mercury has a really thin crust, like a good pizza. <laughs> One of the theories of the planet's formation claims there was a major collision where the planet lost most of its crust. It could have also moved Mercury from its original spot. It wouldn't be unusual. The gas giants in our solar system also didn't form in the location where they are today. Mercury also has an eccentric orbit, which means it could have been kicked out of its old orbit and moved to a new one. 
Scientists also think Mercury might have collided with the early Earth. One theory says that's how the Moon could be formed. Out of all the material flying away after the big crash, there might even have been pieces of Mercury's crust in the mix. Exoplanets Kepler-107b and Kepler-107c are a pair of planets that orbit a star similar to our Sun in the Kepler-107 system. It's around 1,700 light-years away from us. These planets have almost identical sizes, both with a radius 1.5 times that of Earth. But one of them, Kepler-107c, is almost three times as dense as the other. That's because the planets have a different composition. Some scientists believe that Kepler-107b is less dense because it probably collided with another unknown planet in the past. This powerful hit took away part of its surface and left behind a very dense core rich in iron. A huge comet hit Neptune around 200 years ago. But since Neptune isn't a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere, like Mars or Mercury, it's harder to find evidence of this impact. But a comet called Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke apart in 1994 and smashed into Jupiter. Astronomers managed to record this event. It helped them learn more about the elements and molecules the collisions left in Jupiter's atmosphere. This information helps scientists realize that the amount of carbon monoxide in the upper layers of Neptune's atmosphere is higher than in the lower ones. This means a big comet likely hit the planet in the past, since comets have carbon monoxide in their icy tails. Something huge slammed into Uranus, too, changing the planet forever. A space object twice bigger than Earth hit the ice giant. This left the planet tilted, and it looks as if it's rotating on its side. Uranus is extremely cold, way colder than it's supposed to be. It might mean that the object that slammed into it was probably a young protoplanet made up of ice and rocks. Also, some of the debris from that collision may have created a thin shell around Uranus. It still traps the heat coming from the core of the planet. There are strange energy pulses bombarding our entire galaxy, and they come from the other side of the universe. Over the last decade, scientists have been observing bizarre flashes of light coming toward our planet. This phenomenon is called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. These signals travel through a couple of billion light years of dust and gas. That's a rather long way. So far, no one has figured out what's going on behind these bursts. You're standing in a room full of explosive gas. One spark could cause an explosion so powerful that all the windows and doors would be just blown out with a huge column of fire. And you're holding a match. You need a bigger target than this room. How about the largest room of explosive gas in our entire solar system? Meet Jupiter. It's the fifth planet from the Sun and the largest one in our system. It's 11 times the width of Earth and almost two and a half times heavier than all the other planets in our solar system combined. If we put Jupiter on the scales, we would need about 317 Earths to balance it. But most importantly, it has a lot of methane in its atmosphere. It's the gas we use in our kitchen or fill up our car with, and it burns just fine. More importantly, there's metallic hydrogen. In its normal state, Hydrogen is the lightest element in the universe, but on Jupiter, it's at great pressure, more than 400 million atmospheres. By comparison, on Earth, you feel the pressure of one atmosphere. So multiply that by 400 million, and hydrogen is compressed so much that it looks like liquid metal. Metallic hydrogen can be a great fuel. It'll give off 20 times more energy than burning ordinary hydrogen. So you and your match can have great fun out there. Okay, here we go. The first problem is distance. Jupiter is only one planet away from us, but the path is also blocked by the asteroid belt behind Mars. It's full of giant rock debris. On average, each asteroid could be as wide as the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. There's rocks the size of an entire state. And the biggest asteroid of them all is Ceres. It's almost as wide as Alaska. It's even considered a dwarf planet. And this dangerous journey to Jupiter takes about 650 days. That's almost two years of boredom inside a spaceship. By comparison, the longest time astronauts have spent aboard a spaceship is 84 days. But we'll let you take your favorite DVD collection and a couple bags of popcorn. 
at the end of the day, you'll be able to get some sleep after a hard day at work. Fast forward two years into the future, and you've arrived at your destination. You're already imagining lighting a match at the surface of Jupiter, exploding it like a balloon. Oh, be careful when you get close to it. Because of Jupiter's great weight, it has a strong gravitational force, about three times stronger than back home on Earth. The closer you get to its surface, the weaker you feel, and you can even barely stand on your feet. The maximum weight you can lift here is also three times less, and even a match you're holding in your hand already feels heavier. If you try to jump up, you need more effort. Actually, you can't even do that because Jupiter is a gas giant. That means it has no solid surface. Theoretically, the deeper you dive into these clouds, the more pressure you'll feel. Gradually, the clouds and gases thicken and form a kind of liquid. But you don't have to dive that deep. Methane is a light gas and it's closer to the surface. So, this is the moment of truth. You take a match, you flick it on the box, and nothing happens. Well, let's give it a couple more tries. Second match. Third. Ugh, nothing works. Okay, you've got a gas burner in your backpack. You unscrew the valve to maximum, and nothing happens again. Well, that's because it takes three components to start the combustion process. The first is fuel. Luckily, there's enough methane and metallic hydrogen on Jupiter to blow up the whole planet in a matter of seconds. The second component is the ignition source. It's the initial force that will start the combustion process. It could be a spark, an electrical discharge, or a match like the one you have in your hand. And the last ingredient is oxygen. Yes, the same oxygen that we breathe. It's just as important to fire as the fuel itself. For an experiment, try lighting a small candle. Now cover it with a glass. You see how the fire keeps burning for a few seconds and then goes out? The fuel is still there, but the fire has used up all the oxygen inside the glass and the burning process is over. The same thing happens on Jupiter. There just can't be fire simply because there's no oxygen. And you didn't even have to fly there to find that out. From Earth, we can see hundreds of thousands of little meteorites falling on Jupiter. The asteroid belt next to it is to blame for this. When they hit its atmosphere, they start to burn. And that doesn't instantly blow up the entire planet. But don't be upset. There's still a way to ignite this gas giant planet. All you have to do is trigger a thermonuclear chain reaction on the planet. Then, there'll be an explosion so powerful, it'll be visible from Earth and it will be like the birth of a new star. To do that, we need to detonate a nuclear reactor like the ones that give us electricity here on Earth. In fact, we'd have to send everything we have to Jupiter, but even that won't do the trick. Big asteroids, when they hit the planet, cause a much bigger explosion. In 2009, a meteorite the size of five soccer fields hit Jupiter. It caused an explosion of five billion tons of TNT, this incident left a dark spot the size of the Pacific Ocean. And an even bigger explosion happened there in 1994. After that collision, there was a giant spot on Jupiter almost the size of our planet. But strong winds and storms quickly began to sweep away the traces of the explosion. After a few weeks, Jupiter looked like normal. The problem is that our attempts to blow up the gas giant took place on the planet's surface. We need to plant a charge the size of the moon deep below. A massive explosion will cause a thermonuclear reaction and cause the metallic hydrogen to detonate. The explosive process is set and within seconds, Jupiter explodes like a giant balloon. But this spectacle will be the last one that humanity ever sees. The explosion would disturb the stable orbits of Earth and the other planets. The trajectory of Earth around the sun might change and we may see the dawn not in the east, but on any other side of the world. When the strong wind from the explosion reaches the Earth, it'll start scraping our atmosphere. Soon, our planet will lose its ozone layer. It was our shield that protected us from solar radiation. In such a situation, we'll have to hide underground for the rest of our lives. But even this can't protect us. Before long, the Earth will be showered with thousands of meteorites, Jupiter was so heavy that it held the asteroid belt in place. 
Without it, the asteroids would start flying towards us. Earth would feel a constant meteor shower, but there would be no one left on Earth to observe it anymore. Jupiter's explosion can be compared to a supernova. In fact, Jupiter is practically a star. If it were just a little bigger and heavier, it would start to shrink. The intense pressure on the planet's core would start thermonuclear reactions. Eventually, Jupiter will have turned into a brown dwarf, and it would be 50 times heavier than it is now. But because it doesn't have enough weight to do that, Jupiter is sometimes called a failed star. Well, maybe we should visit other gas planets in our solar system and try to light our match there. Saturn. Saturn's atmosphere is similar to Jupiter, but there's no oxygen for combustion there either. So all you have to do is admire the planet's beautiful rings and move on. Well, Uranus and Neptune are much smaller, and they don't have metallic hydrogen, so their explosion wouldn't be as strong. But you still wouldn't be able to ignite them with a match, because there's no atmosphere full of oxygen. But there is one planet where you could light a fire with your match. It's GJ1132b, and it's 39 light years away. Scientists think it might have oxygen on it, although it's not a gas giant that has combustible gases in its atmosphere. But you can still sit on its rocky ground and make a fire to admire the unusual sunset. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are pulled away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. But how can you do it? How can you blow up, let's say, Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system? Thick brown, yellow, red and white clouds hide its surface, making the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. First of all, we shouldn't forget that the gas giant's powerful gravity is holding it together, which is the reason for the planet's spherical shape. And we would need to add a lot of energy to blow it apart. But here's the problem. If we used some explosive material for our goal, it wouldn't be very efficient. A lot of energy would get radiated as heat in the process. The mass of Jupiter equals 318 Earth's masses and about a thousandth of the mass of the Sun. The gas giant's diameter is also more than 11 times greater than that of Earth. It would be around a quarter of the distance from Earth to the Moon. So, can you imagine the enormous binding energy that keeps Jupiter together? Now, experts claim that to explode this space giant, you'd need a pile of nuclear explosives as heavy as four moons. Can you imagine it? Or let's take another unit, a highly explosive material known as TNT. How much of it would you need to blow up Jupiter? The answer is 50 megatons. And one megaton is a million tons of TNT. These are some huge numbers. They also mean that if you made Jupiter out of TNT and blew it up, the explosion wouldn't produce enough energy to blow the planet itself apart. It would puff up. More. And more. But gravity would still manage to pull all the stuff Jupiter is made of back together. But let's suppose you somehow managed to find an enormous amount of explosives that would be enough to get rid of Jupiter. You hit the button, sitting in your spacecraft, hovering over the giant planet. Something is going on down there on Jupiter, but it's unlike anything that would happen to a rocky planet. Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating away from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away into space turns liquid. That's hydrogen in its different form. Under immense atmospheric pressure, this gas becomes liquid closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, you notice that the liquid becomes different again. Now, it's a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It might be Jupiter's core, which is 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The blast lasts no more than half a second. And still, the explosion is millions of times brighter than the sunshine. It's so powerful, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The sun remains pretty much untouched. It gets hotter and kinda unstable for a bit. But it doesn't last long. 
How would the disappearance of Jupiter affect our solar system? For one thing, this gas giant shepherds the asteroid belt. And without Jupiter out there, the belt might grow unstable. It would lead to an increase in the amount of debris invading the inner solar system. Plus, the gas giant also acts as a sponge, absorbing rogue chunks of rock, not letting them enter the inner solar system. So, it's great that Jupiter is practically indestructible, unless it collides with an object as huge as the Sun, of course. Or you could probably scoop the planet up a bit at a time. It would certainly take a while. One hypothetical project called a Jupiter Brain suggests taking Jupiter apart and turning it into a planet-sized supercomputer. And you know what? Some advanced technological civilization could probably do it, but not us humans yet. You shouldn't have made that bet with your friends. Now, your spaceship is hovering just over the atmosphere of Jupiter, a gas giant and the largest planet in our solar system. You're staring at the ginormous pale yellow sphere in front of your eyes, dreading your task, which is to fly through the planet and leave on the other side. Doubts are plaguing your mind. Is it even possible? Well, you're about to find out. Jupiter is truly massive. If the planet was 80 times as massive as it is now, it would have a chance to turn into a tiny red dwarf star. But even though its size isn't enough for such a transformation, Jupiter is still huge, more than 89,000 miles wide at the equator. The planet is so large it could fit inside 1,300 Earths. It's also impressively hot, about 43,000 F at the core. If you decided to parachute into Jupiter, you would never land on a firm surface because the planet mostly consists of gas. Around 90% of the planet's atmosphere is hydrogen. The remaining 10% is made up of helium with tiny traces of other gases. The planet is also surrounded by a layer of thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make Jupiter look colorful and beautifully striped. There's no solid ground on the planet. That's why astronomers define the planet's surface as the point where the atmospheric pressure equals that on Earth. You wouldn't be able to stand on that surface, though. It's just another layer of gases. But the gravitational pull there is around two and a half times more powerful than on our planet. The deeper you dive, the more difficult it gets to move. Under immense atmospheric pressure, hydrogen and helium gases turn into a dense fluid. Closer to the core, this liquid becomes a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium, which makes this region as exotic as the surface of the sun. Now, to imagine the gigantic pressure that exists near the center of Jupiter, think of the deepest place in Earth's oceans, the Mariana Trench. It's nearly seven miles deep, and pressures there reach more than 1,000 bars. For comparison, at sea level, you feel the pressure of approximately one bar. But that number doesn't seem all that impressive when you think about the pressure at the center of Jupiter. It reaches up to one million bars. So, if you tried to enter that region, your spacecraft wouldn't just get squished or melted. No, it would simply disintegrate into atoms. You won't even have time to say, oops. If you still decided to take the plunge, you'd have to go through different parts of the gas giant. First, you'd see wispy ammonia clouds. You might even enjoy a brief period of blue skies, due to the same phenomenon of scattering of light that occurs on Earth. After that, you'd pass through some red-brown clouds. Those are made of ammonium hydrosulfide. And then you'd see intimidating towering clouds lit by constant lightning storms. Way deeper, between 4,350 and 8,700 miles down, your spacecraft would enter an atmosphere so hot that it would be glowing. This is where the temperature rises up to tens of thousands of degrees F, and the pressure rises to megabars. That's also where your spacecraft is likely to start to disintegrate. This is a mysterious region of Jupiter's interior we know little about. It's still unclear whether the planet's core is a molten ball of liquid or a solid rock more than a dozen times the mass of Earth. It's most likely the former. There's even some evidence the gas giant's core might be melting right at this moment. Scientists have suggested that it consists of a mixture of materials, including nitrogen, carbon, and even iron. In any case, not to risk your life, you'd better admit you've lost the bet and return to your hospitable home planet. Sand is everywhere! In your eyes and mouth, in your hair, under your t-shirt, and in your shoes. You can hardly stand. The wind is so strong, it's knocking you down! 
Suddenly, an especially powerful gust sends you to the ground. You crawl toward the back door. It takes you a lot of effort just to pry it open. Once inside, you get to your feet and sneak a peek outside. Just clouds of dust and a deafening roar. Okay, it's time to call for help. It started a month ago. One day, you went out to the garden behind your house. It was a windy day. You even spotted a tiny tornado under your apple tree. It hardly reached your knee, lazily swirling around tree leaves and dust. You tried to make it disappear by poking it with your foot. But even after several attempts, the mini whirlwind just didn't want to break apart. You shrugged and went back home. The next day, the tornado was still there. And had it grown? Interestingly, instead of growing taller, it got wider. At that moment, it started munching on your flowering shrubs. You got curious and decided to keep track of this unusual phenomenon. You measured it every day and carefully wrote down all the information in a special notebook. Maybe later I'll write an article or even publish a book about my storm, you thought. One day, you got out of the house to find your favorite apple tree broken. You couldn't figure out how it happened. The storm still looked harmless and too weak to damage a rather large tree. But after this accident, you started asking yourself if not calling for help was the wrong thing to do. Apparently, it was. Because just a month later, your mini storm has suddenly grown to twice its original size. It's unsafe to go outside now. It seems as if your house is in the middle of a real tornado. You can't see the sky behind a wall of dust and debris. Your garden is ruined, trees broken, bushes and shrubs pulled out of the ground and sent flying somewhere far away. You hear your doorbell ring. A group of scientists you invited has come to the rescue. You show them the garden with your personal natural disaster and enjoy their stunned silence. But after a couple of seconds of initial shock, they spring into action. Ignoring the howling wind, they start carrying inside different equipment. It looks very complicated. Your kitchen turns into the researcher's laboratory. You get informed that your house will be temporarily used by the scientists. You take your things to the smallest bedroom and watch the professionals work. Your kitchen is filled with beeping gadgets and devices covered in flickering lights. People in protective suits and lab coats scurry around. Surprisingly, they don't bump into each other. Neither do they create traffic jams. You bring the notes you've been taking and hand them to an elderly man in a white lab coat. He thanks you as if you've just given him the gift of his dreams. The next several days pass in a flurry of activity. The storm in your garden is growing. The scientists seem to get gloomier every time you see them. It's around 2 a.m. when something wakes you up. You blink your eyes open and realize the house is shaking. Your homegrown tornado must have gotten so big, it's reached the house. In the morning, several scientists pull you aside to tell you the unpleasant news. You have to move out. The storm is indeed growing. Soon, it'll wipe your house off the face of the earth. Nothing can be done. You're gaping at the people telling you to get out of your house. Where will you go? They tell you they're building an additional research lab not far from the place. It's important to be able to observe the storm in real time. Anyway, there's a spare room with everything you may need in that facility. Why don't you stay there for a while? It would also be convenient for the scientists. They may need you to answer the questions that appear during the process. You agree because you don't have any other choice. The researchers help you transport your stuff to your new accommodation. You walk around your house, saying goodbye to your favorite coffee table, your sofa, and your cozy bed. The scientists tell you that there's no time to move your furniture to another place. The next day, you wake up to the news that your home is gone. The storm gulped it down at around 4 a.m. Over the next few weeks, the grown-up whirlwind has swallowed two houses of your neighbors, the nearby forest, several abandoned cars, and a small flower store. It's now so big, it's coming close to a large lake several miles away from the town. People get evacuated. The authorities have announced a state of emergency. One day, you notice that scientists are talking in hushed voices. They look even more worried than usual. You corner one of them and try to find out the truth. Soon the scientist spills it. The researchers have got some evidence that confirms their worst fears. 
According to all their estimates, the storm that once started as a tiny tornado in your garden is going to grow into another great red spot. Only on Earth. Crimson colored clouds are spinning counterclockwise at an incredible speed. Beneath them, you can see vibrant hues of the largest planet in the solar system, the gas giant Jupiter. Those clouds are called the Great Red Spot. It's a colossal storm raging in the atmosphere of Jupiter. If you found yourself at the storm center, the winds would be rather calm there. But on the edges, the storm's speed can reach 425 miles per hour. That's twice the speed of the fastest and most severe hurricanes on Earth. Over the decades, the size of the red spot has been changing. Right now, it's 1.3 times as wide as our planet. The storm's roots go as deep as 200 miles into the planet's atmosphere. The average tropical cyclone on Earth usually stretches for no more than 9 miles from the bottom of the storm to its top. The unique phenomenon on Jupiter has existed for so long because the planet doesn't have a solid surface. It consists of layers of clouds made up of vapor, water ice, and ammonia. Underneath, there might be an ocean of liquid hydrogen. Our planet is solid, and hurricanes slow down and break apart once they go low enough to touch the surface. But the Great Red Spot has nowhere to make landfall. That's why it keeps raging. The scientist also tells you the most bizarre and alarming thing about the storm in your garden. Instead of growing weak and disappearing many weeks ago, it's not only still going, but it's also getting bigger and more powerful. Even the most experienced specialists can't explain this phenomenon. After analyzing it for days on end, they've come to the conclusion that it shouldn't have appeared on Earth. It's against the laws of nature. Interestingly, the storm's composition is a bit similar to that of the Great Red Spot. You're impressed, but still can't get why the researchers look so worried. It turns out that your once mini storm is likely to grow as large as that on Jupiter. But since Earth is way smaller than the colossal red spot, it's likely to swallow our planet whole. It'll grow and grow, wiping out towns and cities, forests and highways. At the same time, it'll become more powerful. People will have to leave their homes and get evacuated to relatively safe areas until there are no more safe areas left. This process will take years, but it'll still be too fast for people to prepare. There will be two ways to deal with this global problem. One of them is to colonize the moon or another planet, for example, Mars. But it's an incredibly long process, and the storm will conquer the entire planet before the first spacecraft with people leaves Earth. Or scientists may try to stop the hurricane there's a technology called the sunglasses effect. Billions of tons of dense gas get pumped into the atmosphere. This gas absorbs sunlight and cools down ocean water, which is the engine of any hurricane. The researchers aren't sure if this method will work with your storm. It formed not over the ocean, but in your garden. Jupiter's gravity shattered a huge comet. It wasn't enough for the space monster. A real catastrophe happened. The shards didn't fly in different directions. They lined up and rushed towards Jupiter like the rail cars of a train. 21 fragments up to one mile in diameter burst through Jupiter's atmosphere. Fireballs at the speed of 37 miles per second bombarded the planet's shell. They heated the space around them to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's higher than the temperature in the sun's upper atmosphere and 312 times hotter than you need to boil an egg. Well, I'm not hungry anymore. The impact was like from a rock falling into a pond. The meteorite fragments formed giant plumes on the surface of Jupiter. Substances from its lower atmosphere rushed upwards. The process generated a tremendous amount of energy. Overheated streams of fire shot into the stratosphere. The monsters left behind them glowing plumes 1,900 miles long. That's greater than the distance between New York and Texas. Dark bruises appeared at the side of the blows. They were about the size of the Earth. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 was the name of the violator of Jupiter's boundaries. The collision of celestial bodies happened in July 1994. It was a scientific sensation. For the first time in human history, a catastrophe of this magnitude was observed. The attack raised an important question for astronomers. Why is Jupiter unlucky? Space monsters attack it thousands of times more often than the Earth or any other planet in the solar system. 
Alright, let's see. You decide to board a starship and travel to the mysterious Jupiter. A space probe would need two years to get there, but your starship is faster. You'll be there in… Great, the journey only took a second. Jupiter is actually big. It could fit 1,300 Earth-sized planets in it. It looks beautiful thanks to gas clouds. This planet has no solid surface, but there's a strange stain on its surface. It looks like a huge eye that can fit three and a half Earths. This storm will scare anyone. It's 10 times higher than Everest, and the wind rushes at a speed of 300 miles per hour. It's been going on for 350 years. You wouldn't hide from such a storm in a car, so it's good you're in the starship. If all the planets of the solar system merged into one super planet, the new object would still be two and a half times smaller than Jupiter. Large size also affects gravity. Spacecraft use Jupiter as a springboard to jump. The giant's gravity increases their flight speed and helps them reach their target faster. Gravity has turned the planet into a magnet for comets, asteroids, and dangerous space debris. Jupiter is a true space superhero. Its gravity shield takes a hit and deflects space monsters that fly into the inner solar system. The dinosaurs don't agree, but more on that a little bit later. What if Jupiter was swallowed up by a giant vacuum cleaner tomorrow? I can only say one thing, we'd have huge problems. Without a giant shield, thousands of comets and asteroids are attacking the planet much more often. Most of them burn up in the atmosphere or aren't large enough to affect us. But there are also larger comets and asteroids. After their collision with the Earth, you can say goodbye to all life on the planet. For example, in 2009, a celestial body crashed into Jupiter. It left a bruise the size of the Pacific Ocean. It's scary to think what traces it would leave on our planet. Most likely, the Earth would turn into a fireball. But recent research from astronomers suggests that Jupiter isn't such a nice guy. On the contrary, it's a bad guy with a slingshot that shoots comets at the Earth. A physicist used computer simulations. He found that Jupiter is equally likely to deflect and send comets toward the Earth. The giant attracts potentially dangerous objects and only partially protects us. It's already tried to knock out our planet many times. 66 million years ago, a cosmic body 10 miles in size crashed into the Earth. The energy of the impact set the surface of the planet on fire. It caused a huge earthquake and tsunami. A fiery rain fell from the sky on the Earth. There were millions of tons of debris and dust in the atmosphere. They stopped the sun's rays from reaching the planet. The nuclear winter began. This disaster led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Scientists have named this space criminal Chicxulub Impactor. Computer simulations of scientists at Harvard University showed where it came from. Chicxulub wasn't an asteroid, but a comet. This means that the core of its body wasn't stone and metal, but ice, dust, and frozen gas. It resembled a dirty snowball flying through space. The meteorite wasn't going to set fire to the Earth, but Jupiter intervened in the plan. It threw comets in our direction. In 1770, Lexell's comet appeared near the Earth. Our planet and this object were separated by only 1.4 million miles, close to nothing in space terms. Lexell's comet came closer to Earth than any other comet in human history. The object could have stopped life on Earth. The comet flew too close to Jupiter. The giant caught it and sent it in our direction. Now, this isn't a very good move for a superhero that protects the solar system. After three years, the comet went past us. It flew two times around the Sun and returned to Jupiter like a boomerang. This time, the giant pushed the comet out of the solar system. But let's not blame Jupiter. Scientists believe that without this gas giant, life on Earth would most likely never have happened. Jupiter sent meteorites toward Earth, which carried organic molecules and water with them. They were the building blocks from which earthly life began. Nobody knows if comets would come with a valuable cargo without Jupiter and its dangerous gravity. If you fly away from Earth to the center of the solar system, you'll see the Sun. Eight planets are flying around this star. There's a belt of more than one million asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. One theory says there was only the Sun at the very beginning of the solar system's existence. Clouds of stone and dust surrounded the star. These particles attracted each other and formed planets over millions of years. Jupiter didn't want any new neighbors. Its powerful gravity prevented rocks and dust from uniting into planets. They remained asteroids and gathered in a belt inside the solar system. If today all the asteroids merged into one planet, we'd get a cosmic body that would weigh only 4% of the mass of the Moon. 
Previously, the belt was densely populated, but Jupiter's gravity threw 99% of the asteroids to other places in space. Jupiter isn't the only one that plays a role in the development of life on Earth. Our main assistant is the Moon. It's the only natural satellite of the Earth. Jupiter has 79 satellites, and every year there are more and more of them. Jupiter is also surrounded by rings, but they aren't as beautiful as Saturn's and are practically invisible. The rings are composed of small black particles. This is the dust that the meteorites eject into space after colliding with the moons of Jupiter. The moon is responsible for the ebb and flow of the ocean. It regulates the life of bees, fish, birds, and amphibians. Even you feel the influence of the moon every day. Changing the brightness of the disk in the night sky regulates the level of melatonin in your brain. This hormone is responsible for circadian rhythms, which are important for healthy sleep. The moon came about thanks to another catastrophe, like many other things in space. Millions of years ago, the Earth looked like a ball of hot lava. There was no water or air. It was enveloped only in carbon dioxide and nitrogen. At this time, another planet the size of modern Mars crashed into the Earth. Scientists named it Theia. At a speed of 8,900 miles per hour, it collided with the Earth. The impact of incredible force threw millions of tons of material into space. The debris gathered into a ball that became known as the Moon. Scientists have almost solved the mystery of the Moon, but they don't know if there's a solid core in the middle of Jupiter or if it's dense hot soup that hangs in space. Jupiter has the largest ocean in the solar system. It's made of liquid hydrogen, not water. If Jupiter were 80 times more massive, it would turn into a bright star. Jupiter is a unique place that will never be home to humans. The pressure inside the planet is 2 million times greater than on the surface of the Earth. Extreme pressure and temperature would ruin any spacecraft that's gone too far. I guess that means Jupiter would have a crush on you. What would happen if our planet turned into two separate ones? One consisting entirely of land and the other one of water. Could we survive on any of them? And how? Well, you're lucky, because I'm going to answer this question right now. So, let's imagine that our Earth has turned into two separate planets, sharing one orbit. Let's call these hypothetical planets rock and water. I know, I know, very original. Anyway, let's start with the rock, because this one is much easier to imagine. All we should do is ask, what would happen if all the oceans on the Earth suddenly dried up? Now, we know that water is life. It covers 70% of the surface of our planet. There's so much water that even if all the oceans and seas disappeared, some of it would still be left in underground rivers, streams, and so on. But unfortunately, it would not be enough for us to survive. All sea creatures disappear. After some time, all other animals, plants, and of course, people share their fate. Completely dried forests burst into flames sooner or later and burn until there is nothing left but ashes. But hey, it's not that bad. Well, it is bad, but life can still exist, in some form. There are some bacteria that make cockroaches jealous. They're able to survive absolutely any conditions. For example, extremophiles have already evolved to live without water. These little guys can survive in an incredibly hot or acidic environment without water or even sunlight. Without them, the rock becomes an empty, lifeless planet. Although, who knows? Maybe someday, extremophiles will be able to evolve into some wildly cool forms that can survive literally anywhere. But for now, the rock is just a floating rock, basically. Oh wait, did you imagine a hot desert or some sort of red-hot steps? Surprise, surprise! This planet is actually extremely cold. You see, without water, there would be no atmosphere. The atmosphere consists of a concentration of various gases, including hydrogen and oxygen. Some H and O, you know where this is going, right? Yep, no water, no atmosphere. And since it is the atmosphere that accumulates all the heat we need, the planet would be very cold without it. The contrast between cold and less cold places also becomes very sharp. You see, water is basically a climate stabilizer. The oceans absorb almost all of the heat of our sun. They distribute it evenly over the Earth to make sure it doesn't get too cold or too hot. So without it, the rock gradually turns into a cold desert. The average temperature on this planet is around minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. At both poles, the temperature is extremely low, about minus 300 degrees. And even in the warmest places, it doesn't exceed 20 degrees. 
These warm places are now the former oceans because their dried-up depths are located much closer to the hot core of the planet. Wait, I hope you don't imagine this planet as covered in snow, either. We don't have any water at all, remember? It's just a very cold rock. At this point, we're just a bigger and browner version of the Moon. The Moon is basically a waterless piece of Earth, after all. But hey, what happens to volcanoes? They're basically our last hope to stay warm, aren't they? Unfortunately, volcanic activity is decreasing due to a lack of water. You see, volcanoes and their eruptions happen because of the collisions of two tectonic plates, the oceanic and continental ones. The weight of the water presses on the oceanic plates. They go under the continental plates and form volcanoes. So if there's no water weight, then there's no volcanoes and volcanic activity drops significantly. The rock now is just a planet full of many incredible high mountains. And every time the tectonic plates collide, they form more and more of these mountains and trenches, including some very big ones, like the famous Mariana Trench. I would say, be careful not to fall, but hey, there's no one to fall there. So, Also, there's no weather anymore. No water means no more snow, ice, or rain, or even clouds. The wind would probably be quite strong, though. Well, that's the fate of the planet rock. Not very bright, so let's just go see how the water planet is doing. Many, many billions of years ago, I wasn't around then, our Earth actually was a planet entirely covered with water. Then, about a billion years ago, the sea level dropped, the land appeared. This has changed the atmosphere of our planet forever, and that's how life was born here. But what happens if it returns to its original state? Well... To answer that question, we should first learn more about the ocean planets. So what does one of these look like? Oh, sorry, I almost forgot. We have no idea. We haven't found any planets of this type because they're incredibly rare. I mean, there is one planet that is low-key and could be called an ocean planet. Yeah, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Still, even this one doesn't look the way you probably imagine. The water on it is in a very weird, unique state. Scientists have called this hot ice, or superliquid water, and we've never seen anything like this before. In general, though, the actual ocean planets are very hard to find due to many physical reasons. These planets require very specific temperatures, pressures, and so on. But alright, just hypothetically, what would such a planet look like? Well, first of all, of course, it cannot be made entirely of water. I hope you didn't actually think that there could be just some gigantic water blob spinning around a star. It should still be a planet with a core and some kind of foundation. So let's just imagine that all the water on the former Earth has mixed into one giant salty ocean. Wow, that would be a dream come true for the sea creatures, but not for the rest of us. The only animals that could survive in this situation, except fish, are probably the birds that can swim and feed on fish. Now, I think even if the sea level rose significantly, at least a couple of islets could still stay above the water. Such islands would be the former peaks of huge mountains like Mount Everest. So if these birds build their nests there, they can even survive for some time. But what about you and me? Well, we still have a chance. If we had enough time to prepare for the huge flood, we could stay safe either in giant submarines or on giant ships. We can grow food on board and fish from the ocean. But without the Everest Islands, we are unlikely to last long. If something breaks and we have nowhere to dock, we won't be able to fix it. Unfortunately, we no longer have drinking water. Now we can get it only from rain or by filtering seawater. But we have to store it someplace, right? And all these water containers would take up a lot of space and be very heavy. But in general, planet water is not as bad as it might seem. It's quite warm. The average temperature here is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And the gap between the lowest and highest temperatures is minimal, from minus 20 degrees at the poles to 70 degrees at the equator. Compared to planet rock, this ain't bad at all. Planet water would also be slightly larger than the Earth in radius due to the volume of, yes, water. The density of this planet would be, on the contrary, quite low. The gravity could become a bit weaker, too. Now, as for both planets, if we place them in the Earth's orbit, after some time, they would still move away from each other and follow different trajectories. They would have aligned themselves not to collide with each other. On one of them, the year would last 12 months, and on the other one, 10 or 11. And that's about it. A fun fact. All of this can actually happen in the future. 
First of all, the Earth's crust is gradually becoming thinner. Hey, I like thin crust. On my pizza. On my planet, mm, not so much. So, one day, water can really flood our entire land. On the other hand, in a couple of billion years, when our sun begins to expand and turn into a red giant, all the oceans on our planet will really dry up. Alright, take a deep breath and shake it out. That's enough of this grim fairy tale. It's a waste of time to worry about such things so far off when, today, I can't find my wallet anywhere. I thought I put it over here.